the other reason, or another reason I should say that it's hard to trade is a lot of people wing it. And as I've said before, I could never figure out why people won't plan their trades. And then one day walking around the block, back when I lived where a block was about two miles in the country, I realized that the moment you plan your trade, you got to put in a stop or have a stop in your plan. And you have to admit that you're wrong. Now, there's a whole psychology on why we don't want to admit that we're wrong. And a lot of that type of psychology comes from Tversky and what's the other guy's name? Kennerman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. And we talked about that in the Trading Simplified show, I think yesterday or the day before. And what's the guy's name? I got Michael Peterson in my mind because we started watching that silly documentary on him. But uh, who who wrote Liar's Poker and quite a few other of these books? Anyway. He wrote a book called The Undoing Project, and I'd recommend you read it. And it's about Tversky and Kannerman. And there's a lot of things in there. He kind of touches upon their research. One of my beefs, and not to not to talk about everything I talked about in, in yesterday's stock chart show, but one of my beefs with these all these behavioral science, behavioral finance books, is after a while they all kind of sound the same, and it seems like 90% of them come from uh, thinking fast and slow. Now, thinking fast and slow is 500 something pages. It's not an easy read. Some of it's really fascinating. Though. I know I'm a nerd, but I'd recommend you read that, and it's going to help to help you to understand. Uh, Dan Arley would be my other author, my go-to author when it comes to behavioral science and stuff. And then yesterday, I also referenced another book that's pretty good. Uh, Klein is his name, and it's uh, seeing what other people's people don't. Anyway, books to read. I have all those. www.daveblander.com. Books to read. Let me slow down here. Anyway, to acknowledge uncertainty was to admit the possibility of error. We don't like admitting that we're wrong. And as I've said a hundred times, I, Larry Williams, son wrote a book on trading. I can never think of the name of it. Let's see if I can grab it. No, not easily. Anyway, one of the things he suggested to do is take a personality test. And I took a personality test and found out that I scored about a zero. If I could have scored negatively, I would have in agreeableness. I didn't realize that I had such a problem. <laughs> it took my wife and daughters and they looked at me like a poo in my pants, as I've said before a thousand times. So that was kind of an epiphany for me. So that's one of the, the solutions possibly is, is getting to know yourself a little bit. So why do people wing it when it comes to trading? Well, it's obviously a lot more fun. And you don't have to admit ahead of time that you could be wrong. And that's something that I was kind of backing into a minute ago. It's like, we don't like being wrong, nor do we want to admit that we could be wrong and it's especially hard for someone like me who is very very low on the agreeableness scale and and that's part without digressing too far that's part of the onion of the trading psychology trading neurology that really kind of as it unfolds it makes you feel better and better and better about yourself you're like why am i the only one struggling well guess what you're not the only one struggling, okay? I just, I literally just, I had a shirt on that had F-bombs on it. <laughs> I literally just took it off and put this on. I should have just left it on. Had some chicken grease on it though. I had to change it. But yeah, we all, we all struggle in this and, and it's and it's an unnatural thing. And, and maybe some of that will come out through this presentation and hopefully some of these, some of the others. If not, I've done a lot of stuff on that in the past. But for me, realizing that I did have this a problem with agreeableness, now I know when I when I have this stress and angst in the markets, it's like because the market is not doing what I think it should, and I am not a very agreeable person according to this <laughs> this thing. But I do try I do try to avoid arguments, especially the cocktail party, because I don't want to. I don't want to ruin my cocktails. Anyway, I digress. And you know, here's the thing 
when things start to go wrong, again, it's hard to admit that you're wrong. Like I said yesterday, having a little bit of that behavioral science, behavioral finance, whatever you want to call it, rear its ugly head, but it's like you have a bit of this anchoring effect. You buy something, like my nephew, he bought Bitcoin at $60,000, and then it went down to $30,000 or $40,000, wherever it was, and he's got that $60,000 in his head, and he can't let go of his Bitcoin. Well, this is an example I've used a thousand times before. A buddy of mine came over and he said he bought this certain company because he likes the CEO and I like the CEO too. He's a nice guy. I met him just once, but like I said in uh, last week at Bandcamp and, and yesterday's show, or this was might have been last week's stock short show, he's a cool guy, a kind of guy you want to have a beer with, you know? And when I showed him this chart, he said, well, that that big blue arrows in hindsight. And I said, well, hold on a minute. I'll give you your first buy way back on the left when it was choppy, maybe because you like the company, I like the CEO, but every subsequent buy was on its way down. And these are this is what you said. You bought some because it was low, you bought some because it was looks like it was it was couldn't go any lower. And then you bought some more when it was really cheap and you were thinking you're gonna flip it out, kind of a little bit of a martingale type of technique. And then I found out when I went to plot this chart about a year or two ago that the company is delisted and it's a penny stock, and I guess now a pink sheet stock, and it's only pennies on the dollar. And then he told me then that he bought some even more of this stock because it was so cheap. So he's holding on, on for dear life. I don't know why. I guess he wants to be right. We don't like to be wrong. I don't like to be wrong, okay? I have a 0% score and agreeableness. Following the plan is hard. And one of the hardest things about following a plan is that a lot of times it means apps doing absolutely nothing. And as I say quite often, trading done properly can be quite boring. You're either waiting for setups, and then if you found a setup, you're waiting for a trigger, and if you trigger in, you're waiting for it to move so you can get your initial profit target. And it's just a heck of a lot of waiting, as I've said many, many times. So this is one in the open portfolio, ARLP. And this was my don't micromanage example. And, and for a while I said, boy, I hope this really does take off. So it'll be the mother of all don't micromanage examples, just follow the plan. And the stop was probably around with that red line was a little bit lower maybe. And I'd be willing to bet most people probably got out, excuse me, at the first signs of adversity, probably right here. And if not right here, probably on one of these little sell-offs, even though the stop wasn't hit. I was in one today, and this was an intraday trade, and it had to go another six or seven or eight cents to hit the stop. And I'm like, ah, screw it. It's not working out. I went to exit at the market and I said, well, hold on, Dave. Could I survive if I let it go that extra six cents and hit my stop? How would I feel if I did that? And I was like, well, you know, Dave Landry says to follow your plan. And if your stop was at this level, then just let it go. And if I'd have gotten out, I would have had a loss on the trade. It would have been smaller than the extra six cents or whatever it was. So I would have saved that six cents, but believe it or not, and I've had this happen many a times, not all the time. If it happened every time, you'd never see my fat ass again. But the market actually turned around before it hit the stop, and then it rallied, and it was one of my winners on the day. It was J-Dust, I think, J-D-S-T. But anyway, I'd be willing to bet that most people probably got out on those slides. Now, this is a little bit of a dated example, but I think it makes for a wonderful example. We had a TKO that triggered way back here, and then stop was down here, and you can see the trade immediately kind of failed miserably. But the stop was never hit. And then what happened? It took off nicely, very nicely, okay? And we bring our stop up because now we got the initial profit target out. 
and we're free rolling on this position. I don't know what happened to a longer term. I could find out. If you go back to the archives and pull up somewhere around July of 2018, maybe June 2018, you could actually see the original recommendation. Now, I distinctly remember this one because I got an email when it gapped higher. I sold ARWR yesterday. So he sat in it for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-something days. Okay, over a month. But then it began to sell off a little bit, even though it wasn't anywhere near the stop. Okay, and he just couldn't take the pain anymore. This happens over and over and over again. Now, to be frank, I have allowed myself to be taken out of many positions before the stop has been hit. I don't do it as much as I used to because I always think in a position, what if I were showing this live to you guys and girls? How can I justify getting out early? So I, I have gotten better at that. And I'll tell you where I'm really good at it. I'm really good at it in the trading service because the trading service, I lay out the entire trading plan. And it's like, oh, well, I guess if it stops hit, I need to get out. I guess if the stop is not hit, I have to stick with it. And there's many days, and believe me, it's kind of like I want you to feel as normal as I do or as crazy as I do when it comes to trading. But there's many days I get whacked in that core portfolio, especially now, as I was explaining earlier, we got in some of these down in the single digits, especially one of them, CPE. I don't know where it's in the 40s now or was at least. So we got in like at seven and now it's in the 40s and we've got on quite a few shares still, even with taking the partial profits. So the equity swings are much, much bigger. So maybe like a 1% or a percent and a half swing on, let's say, we'll say like a 100K account, that's $1,500, $1,500 in one day. And it's nowhere near the stop. So it's very painful to let this unfold. And that's where a lot of people just, they just can't stand the pain. 